This is probably the 21st century of the Urim and Thummim, or something like that. I have to, <laughs> I have to find all the, the ritual elements in my pockets. One of the points at which many Episcopalians and others may regularly encounter and stumble over the problem of sacrifice is at the offertory of the Eucharistic rite, where a series of sentences of scripture can be selected by the presider. One of these is from the letter to the Ephesians and the text as given in the rite two of the Holy Eucharist in the Book of Common Prayer of the Episcopal Church is, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. This text is uh, unremarkable or delightful to some. It's offensive or at least problematic to others. It seems to some to encapsulate the claim that Jesus' death is a vicarious sacrifice, an offering made for expiation, or even perhaps, although this is not in the text, to propitiate an angry God, but that in any case, this act of voluntary annihilation, a form of deadly altruism, to return to the phrase I used in the first lecture to describe sacrificial ideology, that this is somehow a model for Christian belief and practice. As Jesus walked, so should we. This is deadly altruism. Or is it? Much of what I suspect is a, a common sense understanding of this text, like so much common sense, is not really that sensible. In fact, I think that's a violation of the text to read it thus, in its original context. Now, the meaning of ancient text cannot be constrained to some supposed pure ancient essence, which those of us who are members of the high priesthood of biblical studies can somehow deal out to you as you come to pay court at our cultic sanctuaries in the seminaries. Uh, but <clears throat> it is nevertheless true that the value of historical contextualization includes the possibility of accessing understandings more adequate to the text as written and received. This Ephesians offertory text seems to me to exemplify three problems and on the other hand, three possibilities which will be foregrounded in this second lecture. The first is the, uh, the fact that a single idea, what I've referred to in the first lecture as sacrificial ideology, that a single idea has often been substituted for what really constitutes a diversity of rituals and meanings in the ancient texts and practices. And the positive possibility that goes with that recognition is the retrieval of an ancient diversity of rituals and meanings which offers a more nuanced and more fruitful means to read and address the texts, acknowledging diversity in ancient contexts as in modern. That's the first problem and possibility. The second is the notion of offering, which does at least stand in the text, uh, offer yourselves, uh, sorry, as he gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. This notion of offering is clear in the text and hints, I think, at the undervaluing that has been given to the notion of gift in much discourse about sacrifice. I will suggest more or less that gift, rather than either violence or altruism, is both a more historically adequate way of naming the family resemblances that allow any kind of cross-cultural or historical talk about sacrifice to begin with, but also that it is a more theologically creative way of engaging at least some biblical texts and some Christian traditions that participate in this complex reality of sacrificial discourse. Last but not least, uh, and some of you would be disappointed if this point were not going to arise at some point in anything I say, um, last but not least, the Ephesians text as we read it and as it is presented in this translation seems to contain no reference to feasting, uh, but in fact that is not the case and I will argue that even for the author of Ephesians, the call to walk in love is in part a specific call to banquet and to festivity. And that claim will of course require some elaboration as I go along. In the previous lecture, <coughs> 
we considered the history of sacrifice not just as a set of practices, but as a set of ideas. Ancient sacrifice and biblical offerings in particular turn out not to be essentially grounded in violence or altruism, let alone in both, but amount to a varied set of practices with different purposes and varying rituals and substances recognisable to us as offerings or sacrifices through that notion of family resemblances. And Leviticus, as we saw, represents an early version of the later widespread attempt to construct some kind of unity among disparate rituals through an idea something like the modern idea of sacrifice. In that example, in Leviticus, we saw the beginnings of what was on the one hand a process of interpretive synthesis, of claiming that certain rituals have a relationship with one another and can interpret each other, but also arguably of reductionism in the application of the term korban as a way of thinking about all those rituals together and which tends to position and nudge them towards a particular single meaning. This process of reductionist synthesis continues through uh, the continued composition and reception of the Hebrew Bible, but also through the, uh, the writings of early Christianity. Um, so in those contexts, uh, it, we find first the claim that there is a single thing called sacrifice, which as I suggested before, does not previously actually exist. The single concept called sacrifice does not exist. It has to be invented, but it's invented in particular ways in different places, and its meaning, the meaning that is imposed synthetically and reductionistically, varies from one context to another. But at the very least, these ancient texts, which do provide, of course, some evidence for sacrificial practices, must also be understood to be ancient versions of sacrificial theorising. In other words, a document like Leviticus must be understood first, not so much as evidence for sacrifice, but as evidence for how people think about sacrifice, for the theorising process. Uh, sacrifices were presumably taking place, and part of the reason that I've just put this um, object from Megiddo, which seems to be a, you probably recognise the idea of a horned altar from that um, phrase that comes up in a, a variety of biblical texts. Um, it's also, of course, paradoxically evidence for the fact that there were cultic offerings being made in places that weren't Jerusalem, even in the time when you were supposed to have been doing it in Jerusalem. So this process of beginning to synthesise and reduce sacrifice to a single idea is already present in the ancient world, but we also saw that it's something which is characteristic of especially 19th and 20th century social theory and the invention indeed of social theory itself as well as of theories of the origins of sacrifice. The history not just of Christian theological interpretation but also of supposedly scientific inquiry into sacrifices has privileged a number of particular features such as animal victims, human victims, divine victims, but has also privileged ideas such as expiation, fantasised about primal human victims, and passed over the actual diversity of biblical offering practices as it's constructed what I've called sacrificial ideology. So one of the elements of a revised theory and theology of sacrifice must be, I think, to deconstruct this problematic synthesis and to go back to some of the constituent parts and to look at them more on their own terms. If sacrifice means neither deadly altruism nor any other one reductionist possibility, then it becomes possible to address and critique those particular and very significant questions of violence and altruism on their own terms, rather than simply as bound up within some notion of sacrifice. And this means that while there is value in the critiques of sacrifice that I outlined in the first lecture, it is also important, I think, to critique the sacrificial ideology itself, which assumes the truth that sacrifice is the way of talking about these offering practices. Some further account is also needed of how and why that particular sort of eisegesis, as we might call it, that tendency to think of sacrifice as something to do with human victims, to do with expiation, to do with altruism, to do with violence. Why have these features been so prominent when we actually see that the variety of offering practice across cultures and even in scripture and uh, the biblical world itself are so varied. And to these tasks I want to turn uh, for a moment now. We saw that Leviticus um, presents what may be the oldest biblical theory of sacrifice, a single concept that makes korban the way of thinking about sacrifice, offering it to the Israelite God in Jerusalem. Theorising sacrifice continues in the Western tradition in particular, 
in a narrative that moves through later biblical textualizations and interpretations and into the early church. And we will address some of these New Testament and early Christian uh, instances here. The most obvious common trends across the long and complex story of sacrificializing the varied offering practices of the past are the two closely ones already mentioned, synthesis and reductionism. But only if two or three key moments in the development of sacrifice, the invention of sacrifice, I suggest, uh, can be uh, addressed here. One of the key points of such synthesis and development of sacrificial thinking involves the encounter between Jewish and Greek culture and religion. When early, early Judaism encountered Greek culture in the, the rather active mode that involved the conquest of Judea by, the, by Alexander and the Hellenistic kings, um, including the religion of the Greeks, the Jewish scribal elite engaged again in a kind of sacrificial theorizing that drew connections, in this case, between the temple offerings of the Greeks and those of Jerusalem. And the most obvious place that we see this go on is in the translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek, that, uh, that product and that process that we refer to as the Septuagint, focused in particular on the third century BCE, probably uh, centered on the great city of Alexandria. The Greek Bible that was produced out of this process, and which the early Christians knew as their first Bible in most instances, involved a, a cultural encounter embedded in the text between the offerings which Judaism still knew in the temple and those which Greeks spoke of and practiced in their various temples. Uh, at the risk of oversimplification, the Greeks had two main types of sacrifices, destructive ones that tended to be associated with the underworld and with processes of expiation, and much more commonly, festive offerings dedicated to the Olympian gods in those famous temples that you have all seen either face-to-face uh, -face or in various images, where uh, animals typically were slaughtered and after the dedication of set portions for the divinity, not unlike the ritual of the Zabach Shalamim in Leviticus, where after such dedication of portions for the divinity, the results were shared festively by devotees at celebrations of sacred dining. This, uh, this latter type of Greek sacrifice was known by the word thusia. And on this vase, you can see a part of the ritual of the thusia, the preparation of the sacrificial food which accompanied the banquet. Uh, the thusia term was also used in, by the uh, framers, the translators of the Septuagint, to translate not one, but two of the types of Levitical offerings which were laid out in that priestly code of Kurban in the first chapters of Leviticus. The two offerings of the Levitical system which were translated as Thusia in the Septuagint, in other words, that were identified as being similar in character to the festive banqueting offerings of the Greeks, were the Minha of grain, the cereal offering so-called, which is described in Leviticus 2, and the Zabach Shalamim, the um, communion or peace offering, the, where an animal victim is uh, slaughtered and shared. And you'll see that the basis for associating both these two with the idea of Greek sacrifice or thusia was not to do with the victim or the substance that was actually involved in the sacrificial ritual, but to do with the fact that the sharing of food was actually understood to be the essential element of what made a thusia. So, Festivity itself, banqueting, and a culinary celebration is actually core to the way in which the translators of the Septuagint understood that they should try and make a connection between Greek sacrificial practices and those of the Levitical system. And this, of course, is another kind of sacrificial theorizing. It is a rather more uh, audacious thing than we might imagine to say that a particular kind of sacrificial ritual of a Greek temple is actually the same in character as a particular kind of sacrificial ritual of the Levitical system. But I also want to emphasize, of course, that it's the fact of the, the culinary or festive celebration that actually undergirds this claim to the identity of the Zabach and the Minha with the Greek Thusia. Now, uh, it is also particularly significant for us that this word Thusia is typically the word that appears in the New Testament when you see the word sacrifice in an English translation. This is typically the word 
translated as sacrifice, thusia. And of course, you, you might be able to fill in the blanks for me by now. You will realize that just as Kurban doesn't mean sacrifice and Minha doesn't mean sacrifice, etc., neither does Thusia mean sacrifice, at least not in the modern sense of sacrificial ideology. Thusia means a celebratory offering made to the divine accompanied by a festive banquet. It has nothing to do with expiation. It has nothing to do with propitiation, nothing to do with sin or guilt or destruction. And the violence involved, which may be inflicted upon an animal in the course of, con of producing the, the banquet which is focused on meat, is also not inherent in the Thusia because the minha, whose substance was grain or cereal, the minha was a gift of bread or of meal or of flour, that the minha is equally able to be called a Thusia even though it is a victimless, bloodless sacrifice because what makes a thusia what it is, is the fact of the shared celebratory banquet being what accompanies the sacrificial ritual. The process of synthesis of Greek traditions and Israelite or Jewish ones continues through Judaism and into Christianity. And in both traditions, however, something remarkable happens around the time of Jesus. And this is that the idea of human victims does start to appear as an idea with a particular prominence. Now the idea of human sacrifice, of course, does not get invented around the time of Jesus. We've already referred to the story of uh, Abraham and Isaac in Genesis 22. And as John Levinson and others have pointed out, there are plenty of signs lurking around in Israelite religion that there was knowledge of uh, actual human sacrifice lurking at least around the fringes and perhaps sometimes closer to the center than that in memories involved in Israelite religion. But what appears around the time of Jesus uh, in terms of the new prominence of uh, the possibility of humans being the object of sacrifice has, I think, little to do with such lurking memories from the distant past. It actually has to do with new experiences of imperial and colonial violence. The two most significant examples, and they're quite specific ones, but they're both very influential in later Christian thinking. The first is from the relatively obscure book, Fourth Maccabees. Now, if you fell asleep when you were trying to read the whole of the Bible in Leviticus at some point, you would probably have been disappointed when you tried to get to 4th Maccabees because it isn't actually even there. Unless, of course, you have a special Romanian or other Bible connected with the particular uh, substrands of uh, Christianity which regard 4th Maccabees as canonical. Now, 4th Maccabees tells some of the same stories found in 2nd and 3rd Maccabees. It's perhaps contemporaneous with Jesus himself, but it's there, arguably, that we first get the idea in, in a clear, recognizable form that a human death outside of any cultic context, and we're not actually talking about human sacrifice here, that a human death outside a cultic context can be treated metaphorically as sacrifice. This, of course, is this famous story of the woman with seven sons, each of whom refuses to accede to the sacrificial demands of the Hellenistic king, and each of whom is killed in turn, and then in some versions she herself dies. And the, the language of 4th Maccabees goes to the point of saying that their deaths function as sacrifice, not as thusia, because, of course, a thusia is a celebratory feast in which the victim is eaten. They don't function as a thusia, but they function as a sin offering or guilt offering, like the destructive chatat or asham of Leviticus, where a victim is destroyed in order to assuage uh, the anger of the God or to deal with the guilt of the people. This is a remarkable interpretive move made by pious Jews, or at least those reflecting on the experience of pious Jews who are refusing to accede to the demands of Greek rulers to engage in sacrifice, which ironically would probably have been Thusia, because you may also remember that part of the detail of that story is that the Maccabean boys refused to eat uh, the pork meat which has been sacrificed to, um, to the, the Greek god. Now this interpretive metaphorical move is arguably not unlike that taken up by Paul in Romans, and there are those who've argued that Paul actually makes use of the same traditions that are applied to the Maccabean martyrs. That's another question that we can't delve into here. But Paul in Romans also deals with the question of how the unjust death of Jesus under a, an oppressive regime can be retrieved as a positive symbol uh, through the mechanism of thinking about cultic metaphor. But it's important to note that both in Maccabees and in Paul, that this is a metaphorical extension 
of actual cultic practices, which depends for its significance upon people's knowledge of there being real sin offerings and real feast offerings and of various kinds. And that the sense in which either these Maccabean martyrs or Jesus himself are understood to be cultic victims is not direct. Therefore, these stories, both Paul's sacrificial identifications of Jesus and the Maccabean martyr stories, do not actually tell us a whole lot about how early Jews and early Christians thought about sacrifice. They do tell us something about how they tried to make sense of suffering under oppression, using the religious symbol system of their own time as a means to try and retrieve something of meaning about situations of despair and oppression. They borrowed from the symbolic apparatus of a ritual world to interpret what was non-ritual experience. Now the story of how Jesus' death became understood as a sacrifice or the sacrifice par excellence is too large a topic for us to grapple with here except sketchily, but I think it must be touched upon at least. The New Testament documents do reflect a further process of sacrificial theorization that uh, are fundamental to the emergence of, the, of what we call sacrificial ideology or the idea of deadly altruism. I would say, however, that there is still in the New Testament and in the writings of Paul, and perhaps I'll even go so far as to say in the letter to the Hebrews, but that is a special and difficult case, that there is still no such thing in the New Testament as sacrifice in the familiar sense of the word, but rather a variety of rituals and offerings whose symbolic significance is attached to particular aspects of experience, the experience of Jesus, but also the experience of the early Christians in a variety of ways, rather than in one single way with one single meaning. Jesus in the New Testament literature is, for instance, presented as a Paschal Passover lamb, as we know from that other um, well-known liturgical text that some of you may either again stumble on or celebrate, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Remember that we saw that the Passover was not initially a sacrifice in the sense that Leviticus understood the word. But here in Paul's use of the term, we start to get a connection made between these different rituals. The Passover by the time of Jesus had come to be associated with the temple in fact. It was no longer apparently a domestic celebration and so it could actually be seen, even though Leviticus doesn't include it, it could actually be seen by Jews of Jesus' time as a form of kurban, as a form of temple offering, which allows a further kind of synthesis of theory as well as of practice. Jesus is of course also presented as priest and or victim in the ritual of the Day of Atonement according uh, especially to the letter to the Hebrews, which draws a, a very complex theoretical picture about this, but also in a more passing and less systematic way by Paul in the letter to the Romans and in the first letter of John. But none of those particular references, Hebrews again may be a special case, but those other references in passing are again borrowings from the symbolic system of the time to make sense of the death of Jesus, not a claim about what the essence of sacrifice is. That arguably is what Hebrews does in what is a, a remarkably uh, innovative uh, move. I think there is only one instance where something like a more general association is made between Jesus and unspecified sacrificial offerings, as opposed to the idea of connecting him with Passover or with the Day of Atonement or some other particular ritual. And that is this uh, familiar text from Ephesians 5.2 that I discussed at the beginning of the lecture. But this text, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, an offering, this is the term prosphora, and sacrifice, thusia, to God, is not, as often assumed, a reference to sin offerings or even to slaughter, I would suggest, except perhaps uh, marginally or tangentially. It is primarily a, notion, a, a reference to the idea that Jesus and his life is a gift, and since this is what Thusia entails, to a sacred feast. We could arguably translate this sentence then, I think, without doing great violence to the text, and perhaps uh, doing something to bring out its original significance in a first or second century context by saying that Christ, quote, gave himself for us a gift and a feast, neither of which, of course, has overtones of expiation or violence per se. 
Um, the reference at the end to the sweet aroma of sacrifice is where even the framers of the Book of Common Prayer got squeamish and dropped off. Um, because there is the notion there, of course, that the, the sweet odor or aroma of the sacrificial victim being burnt, or at least that portion of the sacrificial victim which is burnt for the divinity, uh, is a part of this metaphor. But one of the reasons that it helps to tag it back on at the end, to say that Jesus is a fragrant aroma to God, is that it helps to remind us that this is actually a metaphor. This is not actually any attempt to draw a direct correlation with the crucifixion of Jesus, but rather an attempt to draw the whole of Jesus' life being an identity into the sacrificial notion of, uh, of it being uh, with the symbol system in hand, to think of Jesus' life as something which is offered to God, which is a gift, prosphora, in character, and which leads to a thusia, a festive, celebratory, sacrificial banquet, a gift and a feast. Now, the context, I must acknowledge, of making an offering of self on behalf of others, which is contained in this text, as well as the implicit historical connection with a life of Jesus that included a death, does not mean that we can exclude from this text the possibility that it was understood to, to involve an altruistic dimension, that's true, and the sense of Jesus' death as being a part of what Jesus did and achieved is of course true also. This does not, for me, however, mean that the text falls neatly into the basket of deadly altruism in the later sense of sacrificial ideology. Rather, I suggest that to probe the false synthesis of sacrificial ideology and to allow the possibilities of gift and feast to stand in their own right here offers a different way of thinking about the text and about sacrifice in some sense and arguably about Jesus too. So, the sacrificial ideology that has so dominated historical and social scientific as well as theological discourse is derived, I think, in reality not so much from cross-cultural observation or inquiry into the ancient cultic practices of the Israelites or the Greeks. It is a derivative of Christian theology. It is the retrojection into uh, the ritual practices of other cultures and historical periods of understandings that really belong to the way in which Christianity itself drew these different threads together as means of seeking to understand their experience of Jesus. There is a great deal of crypto-Christian thought that parades under the guise of social thought in the 19th and 20th century. You see, the presumption that a human victim lurks behind sacrificial actions in general, as it does for René Girard, or the idea that war is the ultimate act of sacrifice, as for Stanley Hawass, is simply retrojection of the metaphorization of Jesus' death as sacrificial, carrying with it as it hurtles back, forming a prehistoric fantasy, carrying with it all the overtones of laying down one's life for one's friends, which of course is something that is said of Jesus and that we believe about Jesus. But that notion, if it was taken to an Israelite offering an ancient sheep in the Jerusalem temple, would have been found somewhere on, between the poles of curious and sacrilegious. It has nothing to do with the purposes of ancient Israelite sacrifice. So without, I think, these relatively late Judeo-Christian interpretive moves, such as Maccabean martyrdoms, deadly altruism would not be the point of reference that it is for the study of sacrifice, nor would sacrifice itself be seen as a single phenomenon that happens to have local variants. We've noted that while sacrificial ideology foregrounds the two elements of death, the death of the sacrificer, ideally, who is somehow conflated with the victim, and altruism as twin elements or poles, that this contrasts with actual observation of ancient sacrificial practices and contrasts also with earlier attempts at ideological synthesis. And to make that contrast reveals a different reality. I've tended to, so far to emphasise the arbitrary character of these syntheses and ideology of sacrifice that constitute the, the idea that we are used to, that common sense idea of sacrifice that turns out to be false. Even though there's much more to say on those constructions and the agendas associated with them and how that story of sacrifice came to play out across Christian history, I wish to turn in most of the time remaining to a different perspective. If not quite a new theory or theology of sacrifice, then to some observations about what would be necessary for a retrieval of some of the fragments left when we had dismantled sacrificial ideology, 
What could we go back to find that we would regard as life-giving and liberative? Although I've suggested that theorists from Leviticus through to Girard and others have chosen phenomena that suited the purposes of a particular synthesis or theory, they've emphasised the violent, they've emphasised the animal, they've emphasised the human hints of sacrifice, for instance. It nevertheless seems reasonable to suggest that there is a category or a criterion, a broad one, that can allow some generalised considerations of many of these rituals and activities, perhaps in cross-cultural perspective, but certainly when it comes to looking at the biblical texts and ideas. And so granted some awkward cases that may not fit perfectly, my proposal is simply this, that sacrifices are offerings or gifts to the divine. The idea of gift is the more fundamental and I suggest the more fruitful way to think about at least some of what is presented in biblical texts and theological tradition that we have received in terms of sacrifice. Now this is not intended by me as a backdoor to excusing or explaining violence as though it were gift. Uh, where gifts involve violence, where anything involves violence, violence must be accounted for in its own right and assessed on its own terms. Gifts, particular gifts, may be uh, malicious in character or disingenuous in purpose or other things besides. And yet, I do think that gift as a category is capable of not only being a more historically useful one for gathering a broader range of evidence together to think about what sacrifice really constituted in the ancient world, but also potentially a fundamentally positive one for theological reflection. Uh, manifestly important in thinking about human sociability and the basis on which our relationships are formed and sustained, as well as thinking about how a relationship with God is formed and sustained. This connection between sacrifice and gift is of course not an original suggestion. The French social theorist Marcel Mauss, who I referred to as part of that group of earlier theorists, wrote the hugely influential study The Gift, Le Don, which suggested that all gift giving consists not just in the mere discrete transactions, and that we talked a little about this in one of the questions after the first lecture, but in the creation and reflection of various kinds of social bonds. From Mauss's work and its ideas alone, I think it would be possible to begin an alternative account of sacrificial offerings as forming bonds among the participants in the divine. And although Mauss and his colleague Henri Hubert also wrote a specific and influential essay about sacrifice, that essay seems to me less useful because it is still stuck with the familiar assumption that sacrifice involves violence and destruction and altruism. But this broader notion of gift giving, which Moss sees as fundamentally constitutive of human society itself, strikes me as a more useful one for thinking about sacrifice. Gift giving catches more of our texts and practices than destruction or violence do. But while this and other more or less objective social, scientific and historical tests of the adequacy of approaching sacrifices gift may continue to be disputed. Let me add that I think that a self-consciously partial and theologically committed approach is also what I have in mind here. It's not just that gift might be a more useful social scientific category for thinking about the variety of offerings. I also think that gift giving may be something that we should think further about, especially in a society where we find that the inequality of wealth is uh, becoming larger and larger, and where notions of property and of debt are becoming a debilitating weight upon the social fabric itself. A story of grace and gift, a story of the notion of the world itself as gift, of our responses to God as free gifts, inadequate gifts to deal with all we have been given, but gifts nonetheless, is a story that I think we could, um, we could claim and, and reclaim, and that we should be perhaps less squeamish about using some of the stories which may uh, have been held by us at arm's length because of their association with sacrifice in trying to reclaim a theology of gift. Uh, the history of sacrifice, I therefore suggest, is not a history of violence, arguably not even a history of ritual, however important both of those might be. The history of sacrifice is an economic history. It's a history of how gifts are given and received in relation to the divine, but also in relation to the human. The possibility of developing this idea is not something we can take at length here, but I want to note one other recent study which I think helps complement and take further some of Moses' ideas and others. In his 
2011 study, Debt, the First 5,000 Years, David Graeber pursues the history of economics rather than of ritual in terms that shed significant light on the origins and meaning of sacrifice. Graeber considers the widespread myth that human societies invented the familiar systems of monetary exchange to replace earlier and inefficient barter exchange. Now this rather abstruse economic question is significant because it tends to uh, help shape the way in which people think about the purposes of ancient sacrifice. That if sacrifices, again this goes back to a, a discussion in the, at the end of the first lecture, if sacrifices are gifts to the divine, then they participate somehow, of course, in the, in the ancient economy too. Um, Graeber considers this myth that money was invented as a means of dealing with barter exchange. And that's a, a familiar idea that's present apparently in many or perhaps even all uh, uh, textbooks of economic history. The problem, Graeber points out, is that there is absolutely no evidence for any society that has ever existed founded on barter but rather that societies in which a gift exchange is practiced, rather than the using money as a kind of instrument that represents the value of gifts or of other things, that there are many societies, of course, which exchange goods and services directly, but that they do so according to their broader understandings of how social bonds are made and how relationships are formed and the values which inform the society as a whole. Uh, it's also true that the notion of debt and guilt are very strongly bound up historically uh, in such societies and in others. Debt is a far older idea, it turns out, than money. Our modern translations that render the phrase of the Mathean Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts, are not being excessively literal, but rather are reviving the forgotten connection between debt and sin. It's not merely a similarity or two different ways of talking about uh, our problems with God and one another. They're actually originally the same concept that sin is really an indebtedness in the divine realm, which can also have its forms in the human realm. The giving of gifts between human beings implies either an existing relationship or the desire to create relationship where it has not been. Offerings to gods, by that logic, are therefore also expressions of relationship. Sometimes figured, of course, in the more specific terms of guilt and responsibility and seeking expiation or to, to make amendment. But sometimes a gift is just a gift. Sometimes it is simply the expression of a sense of obligation, responsibility and relationship that is more fundamental than the need for any particular transaction, like about my bad leg or about next year's crops or anything else. Simply about the fact of acknowledging dependency, just as we give gifts in our own experience today. The origin of gifts to the gods lies not, I think, in any hidden act of violence, but rather in the view that the gods were themselves part of an economy of gift exchange, and hence that various objects, but interestingly enough, foods often in particular, that various objects were appropriately given to the gods just as they were given to others, sometimes with an element of destruction involved, such as burning, but that primarily, it seems, is the means to conveying the substance to the heavenly realm rather than for the sake of destroying the object per se. Even such acts of destruction are incidental to the fact of gift. I think this helps us understand the unexplained gifts of Cain and Abel, as well as the technically pointless gifts, the Ola and the Minha, with which Leviticus leads off its discussion of Kurban, the sacrifices of the temple. Some gifts do reflect specific occasions and needs, that do ut des principle sometimes attributed to Roman religion. But some or even all relationships involve a foundation of mutual obligation which cannot actually be resolved by giving individual gifts, even if at some point between humans the ledger stands at zero. If it is not possible to exhaust the form of a relationship with another human being by an infinite progression of gift giving, how much more is this the case with God? Now, foregrounding the notion of gift does not leave behind every problem associated with offerings or sacrifices. But if it is indeed the most basic element of what is otherwise passed for sacrifice, then there is more to be gained by taking it seriously than merely to reread certain biblical texts or rituals. Gift is, of course, an economic question, and the notion that bonds of mutual responsibility rather than the arbitrary and exploitative accumulation of capital might be presented as a way of dealing with exchange and the use of goods is actually subversive and something which should be given further consideration, I think.
If gift then ought to be retrieved as the most basic aspect of sacrificial and offering practices generally, rather than violence, the most basic, uh, the most neat grammar of sacrifice. The other concept that ancient Christian and Jewish practices about offerings often related to, but which have readily been marginalized in sacrificial ideology is feasting. Not every offering or sacrifice involves a feast. Some, however, do. The poles of violence and altruism, otherwise offered as alternative ways of thinking about sacrifice, are quite inadequate to this aspect of offering. Regarding feasting as a subset of altruism or self-annihilation really doesn't make sense. And in fact, it is meal practice, which is arguably the most important point of continuity in cultic practice, as opposed to cultic theorizing, between ancient Christianity and earlier cultic practices. There is another specific story that needs to be retold here as we engage in some sort of process of revision or retrieval of elements of sacrifice from uh, biblical and ancient Christian practice. And this is in particular uh, the rewriting of the relationship between Eucharist and sacrifice. Those who are squeamish about the idea of sacrifice per se are naturally squeamish about the idea of Eucharist as sacrifice. This story uh, has usually been told along these lines, that the Eucharist arises as a memorialization of Jesus' death, the death seen as a sacrifice, but the meal not. Revisionist versions of this same narrative then tend to downplay the sacrificial aspect altogether, correctly pointing out that early Christian meals had a variety of references and correlations. And so the emphasis on Jesus' death has been exaggerated, arguably, and is thus downplayed in some alternative formulations. But in fact, the origins of thinking about the Eucharist as sacrificial are quite different from this and have very little to do with the death of Jesus, surprisingly as, may, as that may seem. The earliest Christian writings that refer to the Eucharist as sacrificial are the Didache, or teaching of the Twelve Apostles, the First Apology of Justin Martyr, and the Treatise Against Heresies of Irenaeus of Lyon from the late second century. These are basically the three second century texts that talk about the Eucharist as sacrificial. All of these present the Eucharist as a literal sacrifice, not as a metaphorical, but as a literal sacrifice. Eucharist is, of course, you know the Greek word now, a thusia, that festive, celebratory, culinary, banqueting sacrifice. Uh, at least the second two of those works, and perhaps all three, are aware that Jesus died. None of them makes any connection between the fact that Jesus died and the fact that the Eucharist is a sacrifice. Because, of course, if, if sacrifice is not about deadly altruism, why on earth would you have to think that the Eucharist had to be about the death of Jesus in order to be a sacrifice? If the Eucharist is an offering, and in particular a culinary offering, a festive banquet offered to God, in which gifts are given to God and received again by the people, this is not a necessary interpretive move. And unsurprisingly now, if we abandon the sacrificial ideological overlay, indeed it does not happen. The most expansive of these three uh, works or authors is Irenaeus, and I dwell on his thinking just for a moment. His discussion of Eucharist and sacrifice arises in the context of interpreting the sacrifices of Israel and their significance. He is arguing against the, uh, the second century Christian teacher Marcion, the radical Paulinist who rejected the Hebrew Bible and the created order itself, believing that Jesus and his apostle Paul had ushered in a completely new world in which things like uh, biblical texts, rituals and various other things were completely superseded and unnecessary. Irenaeus argues against him that in fact the cultic practice of Israel was meaningful, even if now Christianity had succeeded it. And his general argument is that the requirements of the Mosaic law were good, given for human welfare, but that a new form of cultus, a new form of commandment and covenant had now been given. His introduction of Eucharistic practice into this conversation is quite organic and serves the purpose for him of demonstrating that the uh, provision of sacrifices for the Israelites of old was not a merely arbitrary thing which had now disappeared, but rather that the provision of sacrifices was part of the old covenant and also part of the new. Irenaeus says, the Eucharist is the new oblation of the new covenant. Oblation, um, we only have the Latin text of this section of Irenaeus. Much of the original Greek was lost. But he's probably using the same word prosphora, that word which really means an offering or a gift, rather than anything more specifically sacrificial. 
the new oblation of the new covenant which the church receiving from the apostles offers to God throughout all the world to him who gives us as the means of subsistence the first fruits of his own gifts in the New Testament. Irenaeus is thus drawing in uh, another um, aspect, the first fruits of Exodus 23, which we haven't otherwise discussed. But then he goes on to say the class of oblations, the class of offerings in general has not been set aside. There were both oblations there, by which he is referring chronologically to the past of Israelite religion, and there are oblations here in the present of the Christian order. Sacrifices there were among the people, and here we imagine in the Greek he would have been using thusii. Sacrifices there are two in the church, but the species alone has been changed. And he goes on to identify uh, the Eucharist with this ongoing reality of uh, of, of sacrifice or oblation, not because it has anything to do with any offering or oblation made by Jesus on the cross. This is not his interest at all, but simply in the fact that Christians gather to share food with one another in the, in the presence of God. This is the basis for understanding that there is a sacrifice in the early church and that the Eucharist is it. Now, my purpose in these lectures has mostly been to problematize and only partly to solve. In the second lecture, I've suggested three elements of further constructive consideration of sacrifice in biblical and early Christian contexts, which could be part of a strategy of revision and retrieval to dispense with sacrificial ideology, but then to return to texts that we may find life-giving and liberative in thinking about uh, Christian practice and about culture and other matters of difference in general. First, the retrieval of ritual diversity from under the burden of reductionist sacrificial theories. Second, the primacy of gift over violence or altruism. And thirdly, the neglected element of feasting. Now, whether a Christian theology of sacrifice may yet seem to be possible is a moot point. But I would at least say that there can be Christian theologies which touch upon sacrifice positively and that there certainly can be Christian theologies of gift and of offering. One of those, of course, should be a theology of the Eucharist. While Eucharistic theology has been subject to the same pressure of sacrificial ideology as have other aspects of Christian theology, such as atonement theory, um, it is, however, possible, I think, once we um, parse the undergirded reality of sacrifice to come up with some different results. There has, I think, been a clue lurking for us all along in the Christian sacramental tradition in the term Eucharist. The word Eucharist has been treated overwhelmingly as an arbitrary sign which points to something else, not to something about thanksgiving, but rather something about death and violence and memory. But in fact, the word Eucharist itself, thanksgiving, has embedded in it the charis, the notion of grace, which is that for which the Christian makes response in offering thanks. This oldest and most persistent of names for the central act of the Christian ritual has a surplus of meaning, not just because it's been ignored up till now, but because Eucharistia itself is potentially the key to negotiating that problem of gift, which I think is the real sacrificial question, rather than the question of violence. Thanksgiving, not merely in a general or abstract sense, but the possibility of a human disposition of gratitude, which forms the a basis for an alternative economy in which we think about gift giving in terms of grace. What may be needed then is not a sacrificial theology of Eucharist, but a Eucharistic theology of sacrifice. In the church of Santa Polinare, no, in fact, the church of San Vitale in Ravenna, I changed my slide at the last minute. In the church of San Vitale in Ravenna, something of this is hinted at, as well as of a more fruitful understanding of the relationship between cultic parts and sacrificial whole. In this image, set at the table of the Eucharist, the offerings of Abel and Melchizedek are both presented as elements of what we must probe in order to understand what Eucharist is. Not because Eucharist is one thing, therefore, but because it might be many things. I also find it remarkable that here, by implication, as we find two offering um, the, the firstlings of the flock, but again the fruits of the earth, there, there is a sense here in which a redeemed Cain returns to the table to offer gifts to God, along with his brother, in the person of Melchizedek. These two offer thanks to God, who is the giver of all, 
giving back what God has given, they will receive it again. Bound in a community of love where gift is offered and life is not taken but affirmed. Thank you. <clears throat> so I think we have a minute or two for questions still. Thank you. Yeah. Um, someone's running the mic. Um, first of all, fabulous, and thank you. Um, uh, a really uh, amazing conjunction and connecting of things. Um, I, I'm left with the, the question, as, as having explored debt and gift quite a bit, I'm left with a question about how it got to be so bad. Yeah. Um, and I think the clue lay in your own text because although you were talking and trying to edge us towards talking about gift, uh, you could not avoid uh, the words obligation mm. and responsibility. Mm. And um, when John Milbank wrote his piece called Can a Gift Be Given? Yeah. Um, he raises the question, you know, is it possible for human beings to give mm. gifts that don't have hooks? And um, he even goes so far as to point out that the letters G-I-F-T in German spell poison. <laughs> um, uh, now, I, d I don't want to be as cynical as that, but if you think about questions like, for instance, who in a family may give money to whom, uh, and that's not everybody to anybody, um, it seems to me that escaping from the world of debt, which then leads to what you quite derogatorily at points talked about as, as deadly altruism. Um, it's, not, it's less surprising, perhaps, and I, I am interested that you d did not avoid walking into talking about debts and obligations and all of that, because that raises the question whether it's actually we who can give gifts to God or whether it's actually the case that, that God's the only person who can give a gift. Mm. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm conscious, may, may also, um, Bishop Selby's been acknowledged a couple of times, but I believe he may be the only other Kellogg lecturer who is here previously. <laughs> from, so um, thank you for being here and thank you for your question. I also know you've thought about, more about debt than I have. Uh, so I'm, just as I was taking my life in my hands talking about the Hebrew Bible in the first hour with Dr. Bauer and uh, um, Dr. Yi present, I've, I've done the same in this case. I, I had a whole section which I left out about the can a gift be given thing, um, including the, the Derrida and the, uh, the John Milbank sort of part. So I find those very interesting suggestions. Um, and uh, I think the short version, some, some of you may have read some of this material, but uh, I think they sort of start with uh, bits of Moss and Derrida says, no, you can't really give a gift. And John Milbank says, you can, in fact. Um, and I think it does come back in, the, in a sense to the question that you posed at the end, Peter, namely, you know, can we actually give gifts or is God the only giver of gifts? It seems to me that uh, I don't know that I can get myself off your hook with regard to debt and obligation, but I will try and answer what I think is perhaps the more radical question even about whether we can give gifts. And I think that it is actually part of the audacity of what the church calls its members to do is to say that we can. Uh, and that uh, while it is in one sense absurd because God is the source and ground of all things, is the giver of all gifts and the source of all gifts, all things come of thee and of thine own, have we given thee as good right to Episcopalians still mutter at the, at the offertory even though it's in right one language. Um, the truth is that there is somehow, um, it, it is almost a, for me a correlate of the incarnation that God says, of course you can't give me gifts, now give them. You know, or of course, humans and divine, you can't have, you know, the, the incarnation is an impossibility and here I am, that kind of thing. And, and I suppose that this is a sort of answer in, in mosaic as well, whether, whether you all find it a, a, a winsome or a convincing example. Um, and that, that somehow there's a sense, therefore, in which 
it's a bit like the question of, of God wanting our love, I suppose, too. Why on earth should God require our love or need our love? And in fact, in one absolute sense, God's does, God does not. And yet, uh, it is the kenosis of God to make God self-dependent upon the possibility of being loved or not by us. So I think that that's, that's how the gift thing works for me. But I, I feel very much on thin ice about the questions of debt and obligation. I was wondering whether you'd read the, the Graeber book and whether you found it interesting. Have you come across that? The David Graeber book? Yeah. Any, any further thought on that or, or other? It's coming back. Takes a, I mean, yes, I have, and, um, and also Money, the authorised biography. Um, it, there are a number of, uh, it's become a very significant theme of exploration, which I've only done it in a very light and thin kind of way. But um, it is certainly true that seeing money as debt is a very important economic reality, but it also seems to me to have a great deal to say to the theological point that we seem to be unavoidable unable to avoid constructing a world of debt to replace the world of gift. Yes. And that seems to me what Christ maybe wanted us to yes. discover. And of course there are, there are good elements of this, for instance, in the, the Hebrew Bible and, and in other sort of ancient secular contexts. As, um, I think Moses Finley, the great ancient historian, said, you know, what revolutionaries in the ancient world always want is always two things, redistribute the land and abolish the debts. It's always those two things. And you see versions of that coming up in the economic struggles embedded in the text of the Hebrew Bible too, where of course the, the Jubilee year is you know, a manifestation of that same notion that, that inequality tends to sort of force its way into uh, society over time and then the Jubilee is an attempt to, to reset uh, and to sort of discharge debt, uh, perhaps at the point of reinstating gift and yet, this is where I may be perhaps conflating two things that I shouldn't, that it also always seems to me that even if we discharge all our debts, we then start again in a, in a sense where we actually are all entwined and our dependence on one another has to have some kind of language or expression around it. And debt, debt doesn't feel right, does it? Debt seems to be a negative kind of obligation. Is gift, the, is gift the positive way of speaking about our mutual obligation to one another? Or perhaps that should simply be love, I don't know. I understand that you said something about the uh, Passover ritual as not sacrifice, but I don't understand the connection of the most important part of Judaism and connection with Christianity with not connecting that with sacrifice. I, I don't quite understand it why was, you would in the, that. In the first lecture, I pointed out that the Levitical um, structure, the, the Levitical presentation of the sacrifices of the temple. Uh, which is the first way in which sacrifice is theorized and the, in which the different offerings are placed under the title of Korban does not include the Passover because it wasn't a temple ritual at the time that the priestly writer was active or the priestly sources were being assembled. And um, in later uh, Jewish tradition, the Pesach is understood as a form of Korban because it later becomes associated with the temple. But if you, uh, there would be more than one template, interpretive template of sacrifice that you could place over the Passover ritual in Exodus and still come out saying, well, I don't think it's a sacrifice. The only thing that makes it a sacrifice is that somebody kills an animal. Um, I mean, it's the most significant religious ritual, if you want to call it that. So that's not about how unimportant it is or important, quite the opposite. It's simply about the fact that it seems to me that the earliest theorizations of sacrifice, and I've used that term loosely, you know that I've done somewhat, so somewhat playfully, but if Leviticus, uh, the first seven chapters of Leviticus are the earliest theorization of sacrifice, they don't include Passover in their understanding of what sacrifice is because it's not performed at the temple. Doesn't that split Passover and sacrifice? Well, actually, I think what happened is that Passover and sacrifice became assimilated. Uh, and uh, Passover certainly became a form of sacrifice in, in almost every sense of the word. And certainly by the time you get to Paul in, First Corinthians say, Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Um, that's being understood as a form of, uh, of sacrifice. But it's being understood noticeably, notably as a form of sacrifice in that thusia sense of the celebratory festive uh, rather than the expiatory, propitiatory, sin and guilt sacrifice. So it, Passover becomes a sacrifice. Uh, 
but it, beca but it is what it is first. Now, someone, a historian of religions with more interest in, and more expertise in the very ancient roots of this might say, well, actually, it's an offering practice at the very beginning, so you could call it a sacrifice, and that's fine. But that's part of what I was attempting to do there was to distinguish between offering practices and theorizing of offering practices. So the oldest theory of sacrifice, or at least the oldest, the yeah, the oldest theory of sacrifice in Israelite tradition we have is the priestly source in Leviticus 1 to 8, and that doesn't seem to me to think of Passover as a sacrifice because it's not done at the temple. So I'm deeply grateful for your contribution and reimagining how uh, sacrifice can be this kind of festive meal. And I have been a practitioner of kind of exploring ways in which we can be the church outside of the traditional structure and have been uh, leading dinner church communities for the last several years. And so this feels especially meaningful in that context. And I think the thing I keep coming up against as we have these dinner church gatherings is to wonder what the role of the priest is outside of the temple structure, mm -hmm. outside of the work of sacrifice in a kind of uh, ritualistic understanding. Mm -hmm. And how do we have communities of mutual uh, relational accountability to one another and gift sharing okay. um, that don't look like the other way of, of modeling priesthood? Well, it's a big question, isn't it? So I, let me just throw one or two fragments of an answer at that. Um, one is that uh, while I, as a, as someone in the, the polity of this church who is referred to as a priest, and I'm, I'm content with that designation, it is nonetheless, uh, I suspect, the, the, the way, way, right way to theologize that is to say that you know, Christ is the great priest and the church inherits a priesthood from him and the church has certain people who are referred to as priests within that, within that church. But of course it's also true that those whom even the Episcopal Church refers to as priests are uh, at least as much, and arguably first and foremost, uh, presbyteroi rather than uh, hierais. That's to say, they're uh, leaders, elders, um, and that you know that English word priest, of course, is derived from presbyter, but it doesn't mean presbyter. So we've got an interesting ambiguity there. So if we go back to um, this sort of image of the uh, the the banquet. Um, I think that the role of the priest is to be the one who presides, who, who is the, the founder of the feast in that limited human sense. Christ is the founder of the feast, ultimately. But the role of the priest in that context as, as presbyter, who you may have noticed in uh, my tongue-in-cheek use of this image from the Capella Greca in the Catacomb of Priscilla is likely to be a woman, um, that the, that the role of the priest is to be the one who serves the community by ordering the feast and its, and its functions. And I actually think that's also true, by the way, even of more traditional liturgy. I don't really warm to that kind of liturgy where um, a priest sits back and gets a bunch of lay people to do things and then, boom, appears out of the phone book of the superhero cleric uh, in order to do magic hands, um, you know, just because that's the bit that she or he is able to do and no, and no one else can do. That's why I actually think that even for more traditional forms of liturgy, it's important for those who are presiding, which is also the terminology I prefer to celebration, that the, that the role of the presider should be visibly to be the one who helps to gather and form the sense of unity and, and the direction of the meeting as a whole. And therefore, I think that there are actually stronger analogues between presiding done that way and the way a dinner church community can also work. There, there are still some tensions there with regard to some of the, the things that you might want to retroject out of a more traditional Eucharist into the dinner church context about you know, things like words of institution and particular elements of Eucharistic prayer. I, I imagine that we're just at a point in history where we have to sort of experiment with that to see what's actually going to work. And I would also counsel whenever possible, and I'm really stepping way out of my zone into yours, Jane, so forgive me. I think it's good to encourage people by giving them as much of a safety margin as possible, you know, by allowing those who want to come into that space out of curiosity but still bring their ecclesial sensibilities with them, you know, to, to give, them a, give them a stole or give them, give them a, a prayer at that point or something which enables that point of recognition. Not because I think that God wouldn't cope if you did it differently, by the way. 
you know, it, it's actually simply about trying to make those connections because that's, that's part of why the dinner church thing happens, isn't it? It's to make connections. And, and to, I don't think that it's about simply rebooting and imagining that we can have some sort of immediate access to a first century experience just by leaving the prayer books behind. I think it's rather about going back to those fundamental things about what it actually means for human beings to share food and festivity. And if you can draw some of the elements back in there that allow the church to negotiate that in a way that is it's going to be challenging, but it doesn't have to be threatening, then you know, I'd, really, I'd really commend that. But I do think it's perhaps it's partly reminding the priest that she or he is presbyter that might be the clue to thinking about them as the people who help to make, uh, to make the meal uh, a happy, safe place, let's put it in those terms. I think that works too. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question, uh, Andrew. Thank you very much for your lectures. I want to hear a, a little bit about the uh, section that you did not read in your paper on gift and giving. Uh, because um, as you talk about uh, Michelle Moose, uh, had this uh, very important contribution on the idea of gift. His work is based on his uh, study of uh, Asian and Pacific uh, rituals of giving. And for those of us who live in that part of the world, we know that gift and giving is not just mutual or reciprocal. It is very hierarchical. Mm. You give a gift to your teacher or professor in a different way from giving a gift to your friend. So it is reinforcing hierarchical relations too. Then Catherine Tanner, Milbank, and others use that concept to talk about a more a mutual exchange in economy of grace. Catherine Tanner talks about using exchange of gifts to address some of the questions of the exchange of commodities in the capitalistic world. And then for me, it is really romanticizing uh, the idea of gift and forgetting the original study was based on a much more hierarchical understanding of gift and giving. Mm -hmm. And I also had a conversation with Rita Nagasuma Brock after Catherine Keller published the book to see uh, what was Rita's response. Uh, Rita's response was quite negative, saying that, again, if we are talking about gift and giving, and then as if God needs to somehow give a gift for us, uh, and then we'll be reinforcing what she accuses of child abuse. That is, the father needs to give up the son. So I wonder if you have any other take on gift or giving, mm -hmm. which is critical. That is, we do not just buy into it. That is, for us who inhabit that world, gift and giving is not life giving. It is reinforcing hierarchical relations. Um, thank you, Puilang. Um I think that um, I, I take the point about the romanticization of a variety of cultures in the 19th and 20th century social scientific discourse. Um, I think I tried to make the point that uh, gift giving was not in itself uh, to solve the problem per se, that for instance it could be malicious or it could be disingenuous, but of course yes it can be hierarchical. Um, uh, this doesn't seem to me to uh, uh, remove the value of thinking about gifts as a means of thinking about an alternative approach to economy any more than the fact that ritual uh, can also be used to ritualize hierarchy means that ritual can be dispensed with. So in other words, um, I think that both ritual and gift uh, are not so much inherently the bearers of hierarchy but are typically uh, found as the means of inscribing hierarchy because most of the societies that use them have been hierarchical. So I don't regard this as inherent in either ritual or gift. And I also, for, for instance, that it, for me this is a little bit like the, the limits that we might find at the, around the edges of Nancy Jay's work, that um, it's not surprising that patriarchal societies use bloodletting rituals to, uh, to re-inscribe patriarchy. But uh, it's dangerous perhaps to imagine that the particularities of the ritual are the causal bases of the fact that, this, that the structure of the society represents a particular kind of hierarchy. So um, I do not imagine that gift should be romanticized, but I also don't believe that it's inherently uh, uh, somehow prone to hierarchy. I also, I think your example that, you know, a, the notion of giving up 
the, the thing, so to speak, is exactly the problem I was trying to point to of identifying gift and altruism. That altruism, in fact, uh, I was obviously, you know, I didn't really explore that in any length, but I think one of the reasons I didn't want to accept that altruism is one of the cores of offering activity is because altruism actually slides very quickly into annihilation, whether it's of the self or the other. So the idea, for instance, that you know, God gives up the son as child abuse is clearly uh, both violent and supposedly altruistic, but actually a kind of fake altruism. But that doesn't tell us anything about gift giving. It simply tells us how the notion of gift is used ideologically in a particular context. So I think that uh, the possibility of gift remains, I think, uh, an important one, but it doesn't solve anything in itself. Uh, and you're right to raise uh, critical questions about it which need to be um, thought of further. Um, I'm, I note that uh, Cathy Tanner is giving the Gifford lectures this week, which involve some similar topics to this. And some, they are be, they're appearing online from Edinburgh each of the days of this week, and some of you might be interested in what, what she has to say about that as well. Should we start? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. from a simple human place for his gifts and his feast of wisdom that he shared with us today. Thank you so much, Andrew. This, this conversation is a holy conversation and very important for us to continue to consider and to explore, especially those of us who use this language over and over and over again. I hope we all have a different place in our heads now when we say these words, I surely do. So thanks again, Andrew, for being willing to be with us and for sharing this wonderful message about what sacrifice is and isn't.